I'm Henry Arbach, and for my capstone project, I did an observation and characterization of a binary star system. Uh, the first question we'll have to... The clicker does not appear to be working. Okay. Henry has the benefit of, of going first. <laughs> we'll work all these problems out. Okay, so I guess the first question we should ask ourselves is what is a contact binary star system exactly? Well, it's a kind of variable star system, as Professor Severson mentioned. And a in a variable star system, the total brightness of that star or star system will change over time. And there are plenty of reasons that can cause this change in brightness. In a contact, in a cl uh, contact eclipsing binaries case, that is due to two stars orbiting each other. And the change in brightness will occur when one of these stars moves in front of the other or eclipses the other one, blocking out light from this star reaching us on Earth. <coughs> and a special thing about contact binary systems is they are actually so close together that they are sharing stellar material. And the uh, periods of these stars are also very short, uh, allowing for uh, you to observe uh, Sorry. observe a large portion of the period of the star over one observational period. For example, this star system has a period of 0.267 days, which is about 6.4 hours. So if you're at the observatory for a night of observing, you can see most of the change in the brightness of the star in that one night, which is very useful for doing research. Let's talk about this particular star system. Uh, the star system's name is Ibu and it is composed of two G25 uh, spectral type stars. And an interesting thing about that is our sun is a spectral type G2V star, G G25 star. So these two stars orbiting each other are very similar to our sun. And as you can see here, we have some surface temperature measurements. Uh, one of the stars is about 5,800 Kelvin. Another star is about 5,500 Kelvin, and here you can see the surface temperature of the sun. So they're very similar. And what this can allow us to do is uh, get measurements on this system, such as inclination, radius of the stars, and we can use that to learn more about our own sun. Uh, so I did three nights of observing over the course of this semester and last spring. You can see the um, schedule here, and it totaled about 10 hours and 12 minutes of total observing, which is four hours more than the whole period of the system. So got a lot of really good data from that. Um, I gathered frames in the I, B, and B filters, and what these filters do is they collect light at very specific wavelengths, which allow astronomers to create color images of stars uh, and compare <coughs> different stars and things in space to other objects. Uh, the I filter stands for near infrared. It's about 800 nanometers wavelength. V is visible light and B is blue light. And I collected short frames to get uh, flux data on the star itself. And I also did long frames, which allowed me to get some dim stars in the frame which I can use as reference stars to correct for the relative flux of the target system. And here we have some of uh, the I filter light -like curve for the IBU system. Here we have the V filter light -like curve and the B filter light -like curve. And what you're seeing here are two maximum brightnesses and two minimum brightnesses. And what these correspond to is the first maximum is when the two stars are oriented like this. Neither one is blocking out light from the other star. The first minimum is when this star will move in front and eclipse the second star. We have our second maximum here, and then our second minimum. And that <coughs> constitutes one full period of rotation of the system. And that is what the x-axis is corresponding to here from zero to one phase of the period corresponds to the full 6.4 hours of the system's period. And the data, what we see is that the minimum brightnesses of each three filters uh, are slightly more than half the maximum brightness. Now, if one of these stars eclipses the other and completely blocks out all the light from the second star, you might, cons uh, you might think that the uh, 
maximum brightness would be reduced by exactly half, down to half brightness. But as we can see, uh, the minimum brightnesses are slightly higher than half, half the maximum, which suggests that the stars are not perfectly aligned to Earth and we're not observing them dead on like this. There is some inclination. With, uh, so that is, inclination represents a tilt in the orbital plane of stars. So even when one is being eclipsed, there is still light from the rear star reaching the observer. And what I wanted to do is find out what that inclination angle could be. Here we see a, a, a animation of some arbitrary binary star system. And as this star eclipses that one, you can see because of the inclination, some of the light from the rear star still <coughs> reaches us. Now I wanted to create a simple model to find the inclination angle based off of two parameters. The total separation distance between the centers of the stars and some offset from a reference angle. And first I will discuss how I determined the value for this d, this distance of offset. So here we have what is called the Planck function. And what that will, basically what the Planck function allows you to do is measure the uh, energy output of a body uh, per unit time per area based off of a certain wavelength and temperature. And the reason why this is useful is it allows us to see what the ratio of the light contribution from each individual star is when they're at their maximum brightness. So when we're facing the star, when the stars are facing us like this, no light's being blocked out, the slightly hotter star, star A, is providing around 51% of the total light, whereas the slightly cooler star, star B, is providing around 49% of the total light. And the next slide will explain why that knowledge is useful to us. Here we have the uh, average minimum light values for star A from the first minima and the average minima for star B. And what we want to do is find a way of geometrically measuring what the minimum light can be. And here we can see with this expression that this is the full light coming from star A multiplied by some value of a fraction of the light from the eclipsing star, from the star that's being eclipsed. And the way we will model that are two overlapping spheres. You can see if sphere A is the star in front, then this area will be blocked out from star C. And uh, that will, of course, be, uh, decrease the amount of light coming from the rear star that will reach us. And this is, an this is an expression for the area of this overlap. And what we want to do is subtract that from the total area of the two stars if there was no overlap. And here we can see that if we, cite, if we uh, iterate the function through all possible values of that overlap, zero being no overlap like this, or two r, r being the radius of the stars, that would be like this complete overlap. And with those values, I found that the, the d values uh, for using the uh, maximum and minimum of star A was about 1, with the maximum and minima of star B being about 1.05. And with that, we can now move on to finding the, uh, the value for this s, which will then, knowing these two values, allow you to get this angle. And to, use the, to do that, I used Kepler's law to determine the um, radius of the orbit of each star because the period is known. And we've calculated uh, that value here in the astronomical units, converted it to solar radii, which is also what the value for d is in, uh, did some trigonometry, and the, I, I determined that the inclination angle of the system is 17.1 degrees plus or minus an uncertainty of 0.58 degrees. Hmm. And that value makes sense. It's not, a, it's not a large inclination angle, so the fact that the minimum brightness was just slightly more than half of the maximum supports that this inclination angle is a fairly accurate result. And Conclusions and further work, I, I found that the inclination angle was around 17.1 degrees, 
which is consistent with my research. And some further work I would like to do is create a more robust model of the system, uh, treating each star not as a simple sphere, but including this region of the contact binary, which is some shared material between the two. It, it deforms the shape of the star. Uh, these are known as Roche lobes, and that would be the next step in this research. Thank you. We usually take questions, and we have time. Questions for Henry? Any questions? So those two stars are not the same size. Uh, they are almost completely the same size. I assume that the radius for each star was the radius of our sun because of how similar both the stars were to our sun as a way of simplifying the model. Do we have another question? I have a ringer question, yes. which is, um, tell me about um, studying this, this particular pair of, of stars. What, why, was, why would this be of interest? Well, as I said in the talk, the two stars that compose the system are very similar to our sun. So using this inclination angle, I might be able to more accurately determine the radius of each individual star. And knowing that, we can learn more about our own sun. Let's thank Henry again.